Ladies and gentlemen, in true Monash tradition, we are very happy to stand behind the principles of the West to defend like a failed state and to make sure that a failed state lives up to its capacity and never ever goes back into dictatorship. We think that currently it is the case that in Afghanistan, the vast majority of the people hate the Taliban for three main reasons. Firstly, because of the vast amount of atrocities committed by the Taliban against its people, whether it is its brutality, uh, like exercise in maintaining its, its fledgling and wavering power, or whether it is its imposition of its ideologies which systematically cut out the people. But moreover, we would also say that it is the Taliban that has brought Afghanistan to the brink of being a failed state in the past, and the people know that the, Afghan, uh, know that the Taliban simply cannot rule Afghanistan. But secondly, we also say that the Taliban is linked to other terrorist groups in the region simply because the Taliban is uh, based on like illicit trades and based on like arms trades to, to, to support its power, which means that it does not have the legitimacy of a government like Hamid Karzai because they are based their power on on like brutality and they base their power on weapons. But thirdly, we also say that it is true that the Taliban has never ever demonstrated an act of contrition in the past that has demonstrated that they will ever be capable of running Afghanistan. The acts of brutality that they have tried to commit in like while they're even while they're not in government have only worsened over the past and have never seen to be decreasing. That has demonstrated that there's no real will for the Taliban to change and there's no real, real will that the Taliban will become a legitimate government. Therefore, we think we must do everything we can from getting power. Our model is simple, three points. Firstly, we will make sure that the West will maintain peacekeepers within Afghanistan until there's no reasonable chance that the Taliban will have a uh, possibility of using of like making a hostile takeover successful. Secondly, we also think that the US should provide arms and training to the Afghan army and intelligence in the meantime so that they can combat the Taliban. And thirdly, we would also say we would make all sorts of aid by the US, conditional uh, aid from the US to, to Afghanistan, conditional on the formation of, of a non-Taliban government. Yes. We don't think it's a case that people would vote for the Taliban. We think that overwhelmingly in elections, it is simply not true that people have voted for the Taliban. They have voted for Hamid Karzai, and we don't think it is the case. Two arguments from first affirmative. Firstly, why any power sharing agreement must be avoided because it will result in proxy control of Afghanistan. And secondly, why Hamid Karzai, under our model, can be seen as a as a leg more legitimate leader un uh, of Afghanistan compared to a world in which he runs a power sharing agreement with the Taliban. First argument, why any power sharing agreement will necessarily result in proxy control? Why? What is the current nature of Hamid Karzai's regime? We think currently, Hamid Karzai has a tenuous grip on the country for two main reasons. Firstly, because currently there is no stable functioning democracy for a sufficiently long period of time. We think it is the case that the US has only recently tried to tone down its level of intervention and has only recently tried to install a democracy within the country. We think changing cultures of governance take time and we think we need to give Hamid Karzai the ability and time to change the sorts of political will and political perceptions on the ground. But secondly, we also think that the existence of Taliban, uh, the Taliban, uh, Taliban group has always been them trying to actively undermine the uh, Hamid Karzai's authority because they think that Hamid Karzai has the possibility of bowing down to their bowing down to their power, and therefore they have only tried to increase the intensity of their attacks and the hostage taking and attacks on the government. We think all these things will necessarily get better over time. We think the Taliban is weakening. We also think Hamid Karzai is getting stronger and stronger as people see that a democracy can work, right? That people are now receiving rights, that people are now receiving food on the ground, which was, were not previously present under the Taliban. We think it is a trend upwards that Karzai's government will be stable. So therefore, it will be counter, no, counterproductive to bow down to a power sharing agreement. Why is this? 
Why is it necessarily the case that power sharing agreement result in proxy control? Because the Taliban would necessarily try to leverage control over all vital institutions. When they come to the negotiating table, the Taliban will say, we will not enter an agreement with you unless you give us vital institutions like in the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Defense. And we think it is necessarily the case that any power sharing agreement will involve them uh, taking over large swathes of the government. How would they exert this influence? Two ways. Firstly, by directly using their bargaining power and saying that no deal will be agreed to unless it gives us a lot of power. Secondly, in terms of the, uh, pressuring the government through indirect means, by kidnapping people, by bullying people a la like Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, we think this plays out exactly in other countries. But then, obviously, the negative team will ask, why won't they try under our model? Four reasons why it will be better under our model. Firstly, we think, no. Firstly, we think, under our model, we never ever give the Taliban any legitimacy by the US, right? We think we have, therefore, more international capacity and more international backup. But secondly, we also say that there's no ability, the Taliban, therefore, under our model, have no ability to siphon off wealth from the country, right? Because under their model, when they enter the power sharing agreement, they have that time to siphon away the resources, which necessarily takes that away from the government. From the government. Next argument. Why Karzai will be seen as a more legitimate power without the PSA? I've really like, foreshadowed this slightly by saying that Karzai is only becoming more and more legitimate and the Taliban is becoming weaker and weaker. Two more reasons why Karzai will be legitimate. Firstly, we think that installing a government, i.e. the Taliban, that you've, now, that you've previously kicked out and installing that, them back in, is a bad thing. Because it sends the signal that votes don't count. It sends the signals that the government can and will bow down to terrorism, that the votes of the Afghani people don't count, and it is power that counts. We think that sends a dangerous message that will encourage more and more terrorist acts. But secondly, we also say that Hamid Karzai can better secure the economic livelihood of the people. But why is this? Because the incentives of the Taliban and the Afghani government are different. The Taliban is ideologically based and driven, and is therefore more likely to be dictatorial. The Afghani government under Hamid Karzai wants votes and therefore will implement policies that benefit the people and therefore we see that playing out currently. Ladies and gentlemen, what's best for Afghanistan is not a return to the era of the Taliban, it is a maintenance of democracy. Vote for us. Madam Speaker, the problem with open government's case was they mischaracterized three things. The first was the Taliban, which is a problem for this debate. The second was the nature of Hamid Karzai's regime. And the third was how and why he got into power and the nature of the Afghani people towards him. Those problems will become evident with, uh, over the course of this speech. Let's firstly talk about why a lot of people, well, let's talk about the status quo of Afghanistan. In 2014, the American personnel and armed forces will withdraw from Afghanistan. There will remain behind a number of American aid, a number of American aid institutions, and a number of Americans who will train up the Afghan security forces. Concurrent with that, there will be an election. In that election, Hamid Karzai will not be running, and he will not be allowed to endorse any candidates that might serve as a successor to him. That is the status quo of Afghanistan. 
The important thing to understand why that is the case is because the Afghan people hate Hamid Karzai. They hate him because he is not so much a governor as he is the client of a bank who treats the country as his own personal ploy, who used his whose, bro, whose brother as governor of, I think, Waziristan, basically just used the province as a way to raise tax revenue and cease any form of infrastructure development, to the point where it cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build 10 kilometers of road, and it became a point of pride for tribal leaders to fundraise and build their own projects more efficiently than the centralized government ever could. So that was the problem for Hamid Karzai. Why would people vote for the Taliban? This will deal a lot with Keith's material. His first point was they brought Afghanistan to failure. That was a lie. There were two reasons why, prior to the invasion of the, uh, invasion of the Northern Alliance of like tribal leaders with American support, the Taliban was actually an extremely successful government. First of all, they managed to completely eradicate heroin production in the course of Afghanistan, something that no prior government had ever been able to do, because their brand of puritanical Islam is extremely against the production of drugs and other kinds of narcotic substances. The second was they managed to create an extremely well-functioning welfare state, because one of the five pillars of Islam is charity, and the extension of the wealth of yourself to give freely to people that are in need. So the Taliban had actually succeeded in creating quite a functioning state, it just wasn't one that people in Western, li Western liberal democracies happen to like. So that was a problem. The second was that he said the Taliban weren't a legitimate form of government because they engaged in arms trading and they engaged in other kinds of things. There were two problems with this analysis. The first is that political movements are capable of transcending their armed militant survivors, like we point you to Sinn Féin and the IRA, the various vast separatist groups and political parties that managed to effectively negotiate and achieve legitimacy despite previous armed histories. The second problem with that is that Hamid Karzai's brother is literally an arms dealer before he was assassinated. Like, there's, if, if there's a question of legitimacy in this government, it totally fails because neither side, if that is a, cont a, a contest to grinding legitimacy, actually succeeds. The third, the third thing was that they never expressed contrition. We'd say, firstly, neither is Karzai, but secondly, that that's a lie, that elements of the Taliban expressed, uh, expressed, uh, expressed sorrow over the shooting of Malala for wanting an education. So to say that those things were grounds that excluded the Taliban from votes was a fair thing in this debate. Britt. Regardless of his support for Karzai or not, is the Taliban something that these Afghan people really um, should be paying for? Yeah, totally, right? And I'll explain that a bit more in a couple, in a couple of reasons. Because his then objection was to say that power sharing wouldn't work. For a few reasons, so let's talk about that. The first was the, the first objection you pointed to was that we needed more time for democratization than wanted to point to Karzai. You will see, for the reasons that I pointed to, that Hamid Karzai is not geared towards propagating democracy. Again, the fact that American aid was used to buy votes, pork barrel, and rig the previous election that occurred in I think 2006. Don't quote me on that. Demonstrates that he was able to effectively corrupt the democratic process in an extremely similar fashion to Turkmenistan. So, on that way, a power sharing agreement would look a lot better in terms of getting democratization because it would more accurately reflect reflect the wishes of the Afghan. People. But what Keith wanted to point to was the idea that the Taliban destabilized Afghanistan, they would try to wrest control. We would posit that the status quo in which the Taliban either have all or none or, or zero control of Afghanistan is something that will always encourage them to be much more militarized. The evidence of previously relatively successful power sharing agreements suggests that when that minority partner is brought in, they exercise sufficiently less power than the dominant one. The example of that would be the NDC in Zimbabwe, where the granting of the finance ministry or of the defense ministry does not result in the overwhelming sweeping change. Because it's quite easy to confine ministerial power to one or more branches that is concurrent with the likely electoral success of that political party. So that was a fair there. But then Keith said that ideology would mean these people would be more likely to be dictatorial. He never made the link between saying that an ideology was necessarily causative of being like more, more of a dictator, right? Like you can be a dictator without being Islamic. Most of the strong men in Eastern, uh, in Eastern Europe and uh, like Central Asia are not sufficiently religious. So that link was never substantiated. But we think that it's perfectly legitimate for people to want to elect. Uh, to elect uh, people who have a firm governing ideology rather than simply treating the country as a piggy bank. Why should the United States leave this alone? Firstly, because previous uh, influences in these kind of regimes has been a disaster, like the example of Iran and the propping up of the Shah by the CIA, demonstrated that people, when they think that America is overthwarting the democratic aims, tend to hate the government that results and often become increasingly more radicalized. That was why Ali Ali Khamenei was able to be, uh, like, is able to literally have his people chanting death to, the, death to America and death to the West on the streets of Tehran. Like, when you say that democracy is only ever democracy on the West's terms, that's something that causes a huge problem. But also the fact that it's been a massive disaster and the government that Western, uh, and the governments that Western governments try to set up are frequently really, really bad. Like, I pointed towards the previous inefficiencies in terms of, like, infrastructure building, but they also tend to be heinously corrupt because they know that if the West is supporting them, they don't have to face the same kind of democratic backlash from their citizens because they will be propped up externally. So they can treat their citizens worse and export them. So, and finally on that point, they don't even advance Western interests that much, right? Like, 
Islamic Karzai hasn't actually succeeded in changing the minds of most people on the ground towards being pro-Western and frequently makes comments derogatory of the American regime, right? So in those ways, America doesn't actually get anything out of that government. Sure. But what it does more broadly and more reputationally is it says that if you ever try to cooperate with America on a democracy building program, you will have a puppet regime, like in Latin America, where they even set up various forms of military dictatorship to combat, uh, for, uh, to combat uh, socialism that was sweeping through there. Like, that's why Hugo Chavez was able to maintain control of Venezuela for so long, because everybody thought that any kind of democratic opposition would simply be rigged by the West. But why are we okay with the Taliban? As I pointed to uh, earlier, it is true that they use violence, but it is not true that the other contenders in uh, Afghanistan do not use violence. It is a contextual problem, Madam Speaker. The fact that most of Afghanistan is controlled by tribal warlords, and that's been true since before the Soviet invasion, means that these are, the mere use of violence does not an illegitimate party make. As I pointed to before, they run an extremely effective and functioning government, and that's as a corollary of the third thing, that it's entirely legitimate of the people of Afghanistan to want more Islamized law, to want possibly a caliphate in the future that seeks to join them with other Islamic countries and to want Islam to have an influence on the laws of their society. Simply because that conflicts with, with the ideas of what the West thinks a democracy should look like does not mean that that is an illegitimate one. And we also don't think the Taliban are likely to overextend that reach when they know that the people want them legitimately and they have an accurate indication of what the people want. Because one of the reasons that the Taliban say governments are illegitimate is when previous elections have been, uh, rigged elections have been allowed, they don't actually know to what extent the people support them. They just say that's a product of Western intervention. So they don't have an accurate understanding of their role in the state. We think that this would be a disaster for the people of Afghanistan, it would be a disaster for the West. It was a policy that never should be adopted. Firstly, because those leaders cannot totally be put in 
control purely and only by the will of the West. Peters himself acknowledged that we're going to be looking at electing a new leader into Afghanistan in the near future. We think that because of that, people are far more likely going to have faith in being able to appoint their leader legitimately through that means than they are through a power sharing agreement implemented right now, which means that the Taliban, who presumably will be running in the next election, have had an extra period of term in order to prop up the system to bias them, in order to set up infrastructure and, uh, infrastructure and democratic systems that, uh, that have been created under their influence and have disproportionate uh, and have disproportionately represented the policies they want to implement. So we didn't think that it was likely that we were going to see a monumental change from the Taliban in Afghanistan, where all we were really doing was removing the Western opposition that has thus far had been challenged closing. Minority of the Taliban is better than letting most of them in for a power sharing agreement right now. We're proud. 
to movements which are genuine Islamic political movements that have a meaningful place in the democratic process. We think it's been a significant problem in the United States foreign policy that whenever a group espouses Sharia law, whenever a group espouses having an Islamic belief or an ideology to quote Rana Tom, we oppose them regardless of how democratic they may or may not be. We think a very good outcome of this policy is that it says it demarcates what our actual problem is with these types of movements in the Middle East. It says it's not about being Islamic, it's not about the fact that you want to institute Sharia law if that's what your people support. It's about the fact that you continue to remain outside the democratic process and you continue to use things like terrorist tactics. We think all of those things do not necessarily go hand in hand in this debate. We think by and large the reason groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, like Hamas, like a whole host of other movements across the Middle East have turned to terrorist tactics in the first place is because we told them they didn't have a place in democracy, because we told them there was something antithetical about Islam and democracy coexisting together. We think our policy sends an incredibly good and beneficial message which says we will not intervene to prevent you from taking power. We in fact believe you should be in power if it is the want of the people as it is in this particular instance that I'm speaking of. We think that says to all these future movements they should pursue the path of terror. There's actually no need for them to try and destabilize central governments, that in fact what they should do is participate in the political process. And we think that's a meaningfully good thing, especially given, as I said, those movements that already exist. We on the opposition bench have no problem with the Taliban being in power, if that's what the people want. We think it's exactly what the people wanted, but we chose to forget what the people wanted and institute a really corrupt guy, e.g. Karzai, someone who they have defended who proudly come close. Gemma told us that it was absolutely inherent that someone on the government bench had to support 
Palestine because she told us it's going to look really, really bad for America if they suddenly tear down the guy they put up. We don't agree. We think it is enough for America to maintain their stance against the Taliban. They can't have it both ways, right? If they don't, if they maintain their goodwill towards Karzai, we think they undermine the fact that they have such a strong stance, so strong stance against the Taliban, right? So we think either way they're going to undermine their credibility to a certain extent. Is that what undermines their credibility more? We think their stance against the Taliban is much, much stronger than their stance in, in favour of Karzai. And therefore, we absolutely support that being the metric which we use. Beatrice.
is a choice between two quite bad options. One being Karzai and the other being Karzai. What we want to bring you at closing opposition is that that is an accurate representation of the choices that need to be made in terms of dealing with Afghanistan. In practice, this is not a choice between two options. It's a choice between giving one of, one of those options relatively absolute power in Afghanistan and bringing in the other option to provide a mitigating force in a way that moderates the nature of discourse within Afghanistan and is likely to lead towards the best outcome. I'm going to analyze that out first in terms of talking about Karzai's regime and the government that is likely to remain in place over the next six months, and then in terms of what happens to Afghanistan after that, I'll do with the model at the end. Let's start with the current government and why it would be a great thing to get a power sharing agreement in the instance in which we could convince or trick Karzai into agreeing with Trump. Let's start by talking about Karzai's government at the moment. Opening up, opening up position in this debate told you that Karzai couldn't stand in the upcoming election. The opening government sees on that and said, aha, problem's over this. Which Karzai is bad is done. That is quite extremely naive. Karzai is currently building a multi million dollar mansion next to the presidential palace with laundered US aid money. Yeah. Why is he doing that? It's not because he really likes the neighborhood, it's because he expects to have significant ongoing influence in the government that replaces him after that election. Why? Because he oddly enough knew that he only had two terms in government, yeah. and being the kind of person who wanted to set himself up as a warlord, because he was a warlord to begin with, yeah. he spent the last marshalling every form of money and power you get his hands on into his own hands. You replaced every form of alternate power with a cousin. Why does he have a lot of cousins? <laughs> and as a result of that, it is highly unlikely that anyone else will have an ability to campaign in that election in any meaningful sense. Why? Because control of regions, done by his cousins. Control of movement of troops and movement of infrastructure and resources through the country, done by his now dead brother. The consequence of those things is that no one actually has an ability to move a nation within Afghanistan. There is one exception to that, and that is the Taliban. And the reason they've been able to do that is because they've operated as essentially a rebel force within Afghanistan. But thanks to the US going along with Karzai for the last 10 years and letting him marshal all of that power, it actually means they're basically the only opposition force in the country. Which is exactly how Karzai wants to do that. But the consequence of that is, if you want to stand in this debate for genuine, legitimate elections in the way that the government team mostly has been willing to do in the second time they talk about CIA intervention, you can't talk about finding some way to set up an opposition force that might in some way be viable. Unfortunately, the Taliban is the only one of those that is possible. Yeah. And it's not a matter of saying, oh, well, look, Karzai is awful, let's give the other guys a go now. It's a matter of saying that in a situation where you have two competing forces trying to control government resources, it is unlikely that any one of those competing forces in a power sharing agreement will be able to mandate the entire control of those resources by themselves. The result of that is that you open up channels to information to move within that country. You open up the ability for opposition forces to gain the ability to pass information within the country and form a legitimate op opposition. Problem, we have six months to do that. We have six months to turn around a country that is on the brink of becoming another Zimbabwe or another Russia or another one of any other number of examples of autocratic governments and turn that around to a country which it will be possible to have a democratic election. Hot tip, we don't get to wait much longer. Why? Because the things that they wanted to use as Western leverage to try and, to try and create a democracy in Afghanistan are about to run out. We're in the process of removing the troops from the Ukraine to, to put back. No. We have to reinvade again if we waited past 2014. We're in the process of winding back the aid provisions. We would have to threaten to give them aid and then threaten to take it away if we waited past 2014. Our ability to actually influence this government and change it in ways that would allow anyone else to form an opposition is limited. So we've got to do it in the next six months. The Taliban is actually our only option for doing that in any way that might possibly 
Khazar regime at the moment was simply by the fact that they were opposing the Khazar regime. We think that once you give that party power, once you give that power party influence, once you give the Taliban influence, its ability to moderate is largely reduced. So for, my first point I'm going to do with the um, ex uh, extension of the opposition regime, which is can the Taliban be a moderating force? And I'm going to look at why the Taliban is so bad, all the political stuff, and um, all the stuff about foreign policy. So first what I do is why the Taliban can be a moderating force. So all the things that Malcolm Ma 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 was just saying before about the Taliban being the person that is in power, being the person that is seeking to be in opposition of, um, to Karzai, we think that the extent that they have power is because people probably don't like Karzai. We think that the extent to which the Taliban have some kind of influence over the people is because perhaps they're seen as the lesser of two yeah. We think that when, you, when, the, when the Taliban then stands up and actually like negotiates with Karzai, actually like enters a party formation with Karzai, that that legitimacy is largely reduced. We think, secondly, that these are the, that the Taliban isn't based on some kind of ideology of like helping the Afghanistan people, as we've seen in the past. They're based on an ideology of power. All the Taliban want is power. Once you give them power, they're not going to go stop Karzai from like building his mansion. All they're going to go is, hey, give me some money so I can fucking build my mansion. Like, we don't think that they're kind of going to want to in power, but that they're going to actually be someone that wants to provide a check and balance on the Karzai regime. We think that they're probably just going to use that kind of leverage to gain like the kind of corruption like seen as Karzai. We think the Taliban probably has more of a um, more of a way to influence like the political system than Karzai ever did. And we think that that's particularly dangerous because when you give them power, we give them the ability to influence the next election. We give them the ability to rig the next election. And we weren't happy to stand by that. Secondly, um, like this idea that Malcolm said, well, you know, there's ethnic tension, so we should therefore have like two parties. We think that like in the next election, hopefully, we'll get a situation where um, ethnicities are like largely represented. We think that like the Taliban in and of itself isn't made up of like a bazillion ethnicities. We think it's like based on the one, and that's that's like not the way to establish um, ethnic differences. So now to my like, first approach is why the Taliban is so bad. So to the extent. To the extent that Beavers wanted to talk about, like, how they stop the heroin trade, we think that, like, as Sam said, you can't be just judged by the good things that you do. We think that there are lots of leaders around who are like, you're going to hit well, like, children and animals, and we're going to talk about the speaker. We think that that wasn't going to for us, not, like, we should be in that situation. We think that, like, the Taliban has, we think the people that we wanted to stand up for today were particularly women. We think that those are the people that we've been able to get substantial change on. And now, women do go to school. We don't think that they did under the Taliban because the Taliban ideology prevented them from doing so. We, we think that as the West, we're quite happy to stand by a situation where we don't allow a party that is so fundamentally going to affect women's rights to intervene and to um, gain power in this country. To the extent that you guys think the Taliban is bad and we're willing to concede that, all you do by putting them in opposition to the US and giving them the title of fighting the imperialist forces of the US and standing up for some sort of measures we think that the situation in Afghanistan at the moment is that they don't like, they don't have the US particularly because they don't like Karzai. We think when we get a democratic election where it's not about the US popping up a leader, but it is about like the people voting for that person, that like, we will get a situation in which the Taliban like does, um, is an instill. We think that the situation that we are cultural imperialists, we're happy to stand by that. We're happy to stand by the US intervening in Afghanistan. We think people to an extent are like a, a do actually believe that perhaps the US has like made some differences, particularly women, particularly people who don't see having a political say in the system un under status quo. And we don't think that that's the kind of voices that are being heard and that we're judging as the majority that support the Taliban. And we think it's largely the men that have the dominance in that society and we're looking to change that as the West. We thank you. Secondly, like we think that like to the extent that they are popular, that is because of the threat that they pose to that country. We're talking about a situation where the populations of this country were systematically oppressed by the Taliban. They are really, really fucking scared of the Taliban. So of course they're going to support them if they're in a situation where they think the Taliban might then gain like political control of their country. Of course they're not going to come out in direct opposition to the Taliban because they know how the Taliban deal with those kind of situations in the fact that they have like a, like a history of bullying their citizens. Into support, and that's why we thought that we were, there wasn't going to be a situation in which we thought the Taliban would ever win a legitimate um, election. Secondly, this idea of like the political stuff about sovereignty and the election. We told you why sovereignty 
like the many and sovereignty's change. We told you that like post Rwanda, post responsibility to protect, we've acknowledged that sovereignty isn't always about get, having like a, ha, the, the government having sole power of that country. We told you it's about the citizens. And we told you how the Taliban had failed the citizens and that's what allowed us to intervene in the first place. And that's what we really stand for and be consistent with. We think that secondly, that to the extent we wanted elections, to the extent that we wanted the democracy, that wasn't going to happen when you gave Taliban the leverage six months before the election. We think that all you're going to give, get is to give them the situation to re the election, give them the situation to hijack the election, and you're going to give them the situation in which um, in which those elections were probably not going to be bad, going to be good. We think that you gave them a situation where you gave them far too much control, and that could, control could be extended upon. No, thank you. So finally, this idea of foreign policy. Now we told, like, this was like not really acknowledged at all by that. We told you why it was important that the US intervened twice before and that it should have been now. Despite the fact that Jim wanted to talk about like terrorists and Al-Qaeda, we think the fact that like tell the Taliban was harboring Al-Qaeda is an extent to the fact that we, like it's evidence of the fact that we don't want them to have political power ever again, Madam Speaker. We think secondly, like despite the fact we think that the way that the US then further legitimised that war and further justified that war was by talking about the substantial changes that had happened in Afghanistan post Taliban. We think when the way they legitimised that war to the, like, the international community was because of the significant like, women's rights that helped to install. We think that it was a good thing for them to be consistent with that and not allow like a, like a regime that had systematically oppressed their people to gain power. We, if that came at the cost of us being cultural imperialists, we're happy to stand by that because in a situation where like with children can't go to school getting shot in the head, we're quite happy to like face the burden of being cultural and imperialist or interventionist if that resulted in substantial good changes for those people. We told you why the Taliban were not were not never going to be a moderating force. If the only thing that they wanted was power, and the only thing they were going to do if we gave them that power was use it to do that. Thank you. 
reason not to allow them the power they should have had long ago. Let's move on to this reason about how they said it was the US right, the US is right to intervene in sovereignty when rights were infringed. And they gave the example explicitly of the lack of women's rights. Like, does that mean that we should be rigging elections in Saudi Arabia? Like, it's first things if we could. Second things if that would like, incredibly jeopardize our oil interests. It is hypocritical and unrealistic for the opposition to say that a lack of women's rights means that we should intervene 